Thank you. I'd like to thank Sages, Dr. Powers, Dr. Melvin, for the privilege of presenting today. I am going to be talking about the medical legal consequences of bile duct injury. I don't have any disclosures. So when I thought about this topic, I thought, what are the things that I would want to know if I was attending this lecture? And the four things that came to mind are why do bile duct injuries occur? Why do surgeons get sued for them? What do we do when we get sued? And how do I prevent being sued? And I'm sure that last one is probably of most interest. So as we've talked about a little bit already, bile duct injuries, the prevalence ranges from about 0.2 to 1.1%. Somewhere around a half a percent is pretty much the accepted average. It's not the most common surgical complication, um, iatrogenic surgical complication, but it is one of the most serious. And interestingly, a Delphi method survey of 614 expert surgeons found that pretty much all of the surgeons unanimously agreed that misidentification of the anatomy is what leads to an injury. There are some non-anatomic quote-unquote causes. So in a very interesting paper in uh, the journal uh, in JAX in 2009, surgeons who were a little bit older and had been in practice a little bit longer were found to have a higher rate of bile duct injury. I kind of liken that to when people say, oh, most car accidents happen closer to home. Well, that's because you're closer to home most of the time. So if you've been practicing longer and you're a little bit older, you've done more cases and you're more likely to have a bile duct injury as well. Um, but interestingly, those surgeons who do work at academic institutions or work with residents tend to have a lower bile duct injury rate. Now, when we look at mortality related to a bile duct injury, the patient factors um, in a study by Telem et al. in 2016 showed that age greater than 61, Medicare insurance, male gender, white race, diabetes, hypertension, and pulmonary complications after surgery are most likely to lead to mortality related to a bile duct injury. So when we look anatomically at the things that cause bile duct injury, the four common errors described by Strasburg, I think, still apply very well. These are, number one, the infundibular technique error trap. So this error trap, a lot of us like doing an infundibular dissection. The Kellogg's triangle is normally a nice, friendly place to be dissecting. However, when you have a pretty congested, inflammatory mass of a gallbladder, that area sure that this pointer will show up there. So this area here becomes pretty shortened and thickened and inflamed and often the cystic duct and the common bile duct can um, be pretty intimately intertwined here. And so dissecting, he says in his paper, when you see the flare, beware. So if you see that flare at the infundibulum, um, it should raise a caution flag in your mind. The fundus down error trap is another one that's described. So for those that do a fundus down technique, when you have a pretty inflammatory congested gallbladder, the planes here between A and B can become fused. And so to the surgeon's eye, what we think is normally the cystic duct is actually potentially the common hepatic duct. The aberrant right hepatic on intraoperative cholangiogram is the third one that's described. Um, this one makes me very sad to look at these pictures. So on the far left there, you see a patient who's had um, a normal intraoperative cholangiogram, and then the middle is an ERCP that's also normal. However, the far right is the PTC overlaying on top of that ERCP, and you can see that there was an aberrant right hepatic, a posterior branch there that has been inadvertently clipped and damaged. This is from Strasburg's paper as well. You can see an inadvertent injury to the right hepatic there. And finally, I'm not sure why this is showing like this, but the last one that he describes is a parallel union of the cystic duct. So that's normally 75% of the time we have this nice angular cystic duct that we're used to seeing. But about 20% of the time, it can be a pretty long segment that runs parallel to the common bile duct that can lead to inadvertent injury of a, a major biliary structure. There are other causes of bile duct injury. Um, sometimes there can be additional aberrant anatomy, as Dr. Melstrom described. There can be retraction injuries and thermal injuries. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but in this case report, you can see there's a pretty long segment here that was described. This is a patient who was transferred to a tertiary care center after an elective outpatient laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and that whole section is a missing portion of the common bile duct due to thermal injury. So this is why we're here. Unfortunately, these things lead to lawsuits. There are 
more than enough people out there that are looking for these cases, um, and there are some reasons. Why do we get sued? There are patient factors and there are surgeon factors. The patient factors are essentially time, pain, and money. So time, these patients are in the hospital longer, they're away from their family, they're away from their loved ones, and they start to get depressed, they start to get angry. When I talk about pain, so they're also experiencing more pain. Bilomas are painful, drains are painful, any time spent in the hospital to them is pain. Um, so the, the likelihood if an injury is recognized earlier versus later goes up as far as a successful lawsuit. And finally, when we get to that lawsuit, the mean payment for a bile duct injury is about a half a million dollars. When we look at surgeon factors, so again, delay in diagnosis. Um, a really good paper by Roy et al. looked at claims for injuries that had been paid. And so if the injury was recognized promptly and addressed, those claims were about 50% successful. But if the injury is recognized later, those claims were actually 90% successful. Other surgeon factors include lack of transparency, lack of truthfulness, failure on part of the surgeon to fully inform the patient of the risks of the procedure beforehand. A big one is poor documentation or communication and then poor safety procedures um, preoperatively or intraoperatively. So the big things I wanna talk about are documentation and communication. So documentation is the key. O oftentimes it's the only thing that we have to go back and look at and it is the evidence that's presented in a court of law. If it isn't documented, it didn't happen. I should mention these few slides, you can see there at the bottom, I actually sat down with some lawyers and asked their advice because fortunately, this is not something that I'm personally too familiar with, um, but MedMal cases uh, are actually often bile duct injury centered and they said the biggest thing you can do is document. Document, document, document and have good communication. Cases can be lost or won based on documentation. If you're in court, your credibility is actually really um, bolstered when your testimony is supported by what you put in the electronic medical record. And in death cases, this is pretty interesting, sometimes testimony is not allowed into court until it's been corroborated by the electronic medical record. Think about what you're recording. Um, be thorough, be accurate, don't use a lot of abbreviations if you can help it, be careful when you're just checking boxes or looking at drop down menus. And then for me the big one is the cut and paste. We're all guilty of it. We've all gone back and looked at medical records where a patient was admitted for a small bowel obstruction but if you look at the plan it was copied and pasted from their admission for a vasectomy. Um, so avoid the cutting and pasting if you can. It's really hard to explain the inaccurate information afterwards. Document any conversations you have with patients, with their family members, with anybody that's there with them. These people, it often it's a time of stress, it's a time of illness. They don't remember what you've talked about. They don't necessarily understand what you're talking about. But if you've documented it, especially in an EMR where they have the access to their notes afterward, um, that's a really important thing to do. This is becoming bigger and bigger. So the electronic trail, now lawyers are requesting an audit trail. With an audit trail, they can see what records were created, when they were created, by whom they were created, and when they've last been viewed and modified. Why is that important? Because if you go to court and you say, I saw this patient before, I looked at this patient's history before I saw them, they can go back to the date of your clinic visit and actually look and see if you reviewed the chart before your visit. If you say you looked at a CT scan before you operated on somebody, they can go back and see if you viewed that CT scan prior to operating on a patient. Um, and this kind of discovery or audit trail is really upping the dollar value of um, med mal cases. Finally, social media. So documentation in social media, just don't do it. There are federal and now state regulations, um, some legal policies and some guidelines regarding what you can and cannot post. There are more complaints about violation of patient confidentiality. If you are involved in a lawsuit, do not comment on it and on social media. Don't post anything that can identify a patient. Um, don't friend patients online. Don't use your personal email and don't use um, unencrypted email. The reason that I actually became friends with this lawyer is because she is, during my residency, our program director asked her to come talk with us about, as residents, not taking pictures and sending them to the attendings like, hey, do you think this is a wound infection? That's a bad idea. Communication, so conversations or lack thereof are a lot of times the subject of what is talked about at a trial. 
Um, don't rush the family members. Make eye contact, sit down, stay with them, talk with them. Don't use medical terms. Talk to them as if they were family members using lay terms and make sure they understand what you're saying. Provide handouts, have them watch a video if it's appropriate, and make sure they know what to expect up front when it comes to a surgical procedure. If there's a complication afterwards, be honest with the family, be honest with the patient, and be honest as far as what the expectations are for the future. So then, let's just say you've gotten sued. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but contact risk management, get a good lawyer. If you're provided one by your institution, great. Do not look at the patient's chart. Knee-jerk reaction, I wanna see what I actually did, don't do it. Don't open the chart unless your lawyer tells you to. Don't talk to anybody about the case unless your lawyer tells you to. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about is how do we prevent being sued? Um, and SAGES, years ago, in their wisdom, started a safe cholecystectomy program, and I'll talk about the six major things that, that it, the guidelines it provides. Number one, the critical view of safety. Two is an interoperative timeout. Three is understanding the aberrant anatomy. Four is imaging. Five is recognizing a difficult cole and how to manage it. And six is getting help for difficult cases. So what is the critical view of safety? How many of you have asked residents or fellows in the OR and nobody can tell you what it, the actual three major tenets of a critical view of safety are? Number one, clearing the hepatocystic triangle. Number two, separating the lower gallbladder bed from the liver bed, all, lower liver bed, all the way up to the cystic plate. And then number three, only two structures entering the gallbladder. I add a fourth caveat, you have to be able to see those two structures only entering the gallbladder anteriorly and posteriorly. So this is a very interesting study of 1,100 lap coles. The major bile duct injury rate was 0.6%. They went back and reviewed the videos of the 65 complications. Of those 65, the op notes recorded that the critical view of safety was achieved in 80%. Well, an objective review of the videos showed that the actual critical view of safety achievement was 10%, and in those who had a bile duct injury, it was 0%. So be honest with ourselves as far as what a true critical view of safety is. The interoperative timeout, this is your speak now or forever hold your peace moment. This is the last time I actually in the OR say, is everybody happy? Does this look like the cystic duct? Does this look like a cystic artery? Let's clip away. The potential for aberrant anatomy is there. Uh, the mind cannot, the eye cannot see what the mind does not know. So be aware, the major three ones that you're probably gonna see are a short cystic duct, aberrant hepatic duct, or that right hepatic artery that crosses over the common bile duct. Imaging, I'm gonna take a minute to talk about this because um, imaging can be our, our, our friend. A lot of us have used intraoperative cholangiogram routinely or selectively. Some people use ultrasound. I do wanna take a second to talk about fluorescence cholangiography just because I'm kind of excited about it. So indocyanin in green binds to plasma proteins. It's secreted into the bile. Um, it's secreted in the liver cells and it pretty much entirely goes into the bile. It absorbs light in a near infrared spectrum and then emits it at a slightly higher spectrum. One of our partners started using this pretty routinely and uh, most of us have kind of agreed that it, it seems very useful. The upsides, so it's pretty safe, it's effective. There's a lot of articles now with good data showing that it is safe and effective. It can show you um, your anatomic landmarks quicker than a, than a routine intraoperative cholangiogram. But if there's cholelithiasis or an occluded cystic duct, it's not necessarily gonna show you the ductal anatomy here very well. The hurdles, pretty much money. Investing in the initial equipment and then turning the equipment over. This is a nice case. So one of my partners um, was dissecting out a gallbladder and used the, in, the fluorescence cholangiography here, as he was dissecting out, you see three structures. Well, that's not cool. So seeing that it wasn't actually, this structure was not fluorescing, he was able to continue his dissection. He clipped the two structures that he truly knew. If you look back, these ones he anteriorly and posteriorly identified were only going into the gallbladder. And then worked on isolating this, and it turned out to be a posterior branch of the artery. So he was able to clip it. Again, the pitfalls, so if you have an occluded cystic duct, it's not as helpful. Number five, recognizing a different, difficult coli. How do you manage it? What makes a lap coli difficult? So obesity, surgical history, male gender and age. With a gallbladder, acute or, coli, acute or chronic cholecystitis, Maritzi syndrome, cholangiocarcinoma, or a wide or short cystic duct. 
What are our options? You can do a fundus first if you have adequate visualization, put in a tube, convert to open, do a subtotal cholecystectomy, or just abort or treat conservatively until it's safer. And finally, load your boat. Um, if the anatomy is somewhat unclear, if your operation is stalled, if you don't know if you've injured something, call somebody. It's preferable to have somebody available ahead of time, um, but load your, load your boat properly. How um, else? So thermal injuries are something I want to take a second to talk about. Limit your cautery use to thin layers of tissue that you can see through. Only use energy above Riviera sulcus and use short bursts of cautery. Communication, so we talked about this, I'll just go quickly. As far as transparency, a study looked at residents that were told to go do a mock lap coli on a simulator. Half of them got a bile duct injury, half of them discovered cancer, and in an evaluation afterwards, it was found that they were more comfortable going and telling the mock family about the mock cancer than they were an actual bile duct injury. So we need to learn how to talk to our patients about these things. Finally, a templated consent form, a templated op note. One of my partners has a fantastic op note that has spots for all of these pictures so that you, it's documented. Um, you get all the key parts in there and when and if a suit is ever filed, um, this can prevent a decision in the patient's favor. So in summary, make sure you have good insurance, prepare the patient preoperatively, um, informed consent, get imaging if you need it, Operate using the safe, SAGE's safe cholecystectomy guidelines. Good documentations can save your butt. If there's a complication, be transparent and truthful. Patients really do appreciate it, and it can save you a lawsuit. Don't repair, perform a repair of the complication if you're, if you're not qualified. Get a specialist involved if needed. And finally, if you are sued, find a le legal team that you trust, and don't look at the patient's chart or talk to other people about the case. Thank you.